In the previous video, we covered what exactly declarative code is, how it differs from imperative code, and the benefits it has. I won't recap the entire video here, but the key bit of context required for this video is that with declarative code, we don't reassign variables after their initial declaration. This seems to be a big conceptual blocker for people, and it makes sense because data in our application changes over time. How are we supposed to represent those changes if we can never reassign a variable? It feels like asking someone to get dressed without changing their clothes. Again, we are going to take a more abstract visual approach to highlight the fundamental concepts, because the particular technology and syntax used is secondary to that. However, I will also provide example RxJS code alongside the visualization each step of the way, but just keep in mind that these concepts are not RxJS specific. So let's just get started. Let's say we have some data for a page. It doesn't really matter what, but perhaps it is a list of items for a shop. And there we go. We have added a declaration for the data and this data is declarative because it is never reassigned. Easy enough to do if you are hard coding an array that never changes. But what if we want to load in this data from some remote database? Now we're getting into the weeds of this whole change without change nonsense. The key part here is that the declaration of our data needs to describe this potential change up front. And part of that declaration will involve defining its dependency on the request to the database and how it should handle any data that arrives from that dependency. This creates a reactive graph that looks like this. We have our request to the database that is the initiator of change, as in the thing that is initially triggered that will start a chain reaction of other changes. And our data declaration depends on that request. When our request declaration emits some value, our data declaration will react to it. And what that reaction is, is defined up front in the declaration of our data. In this case, the reaction is simple. When our request emits data, our data declaration will become whatever value that request retrieved from the database. Our data value can now change at runtime without ever being reassigned. This reactive graph is the key in understanding the declarative approach. You need to get to the point where you can construct these in your head or on paper or whatever. This is the fundamental structure and the fundamental benefit of declarative code. The RxJS syntax or whatever else you might use to implement this graph is secondary. This is still pretty simple though. What if this data needs to be paginated? We need to consider how we would modify this reactive graph to account for pagination. We are going to add a new declaration, the current page number. But where does it belong in our graph? You might want to pause here for a second and consider what is the most fundamental declaration out of these three. Which of these is the initial initiator of change that everything else should react to? I feel like a more intuitive answer is the request for data from the database being the most fundamental part of this data flow. But it's actually the page number. The page number declaration sits at the top because it is the page number changing that will trigger everything else. Every time the page number changes, we want to send a new request to the database and every time we get data from the database, we want our data declaration to update. So our reactive graph looks like this. What if we want to add a filter, like filtering by price, user reviews, text filtering, or anything else? We are going to add a new declaration that represents whatever filter should be applied. But again, where should it live in this reactive graph? What should the filter react to, if anything, and what other nodes in our reactive graph should react to the filter changing? It actually depends on how exactly we want the filter to behave. If we want to filter just the data we already have locally, then we can set up our reactive graph like this. What we've done here is group both our request and filter declarations together. This means that our data declaration will react to either of these two declarations changing. Our data declaration can now use the values from both the request and filter declarations to determine what its own value should be. If the filter ever changes, it will recalculate its value again using both values. If new data comes through from the request declaration, it will also recalculate its value again using both values. But the potential problem with this approach is that it only applies to the data we already have locally, 
The filter changing might impact what should have been pulled in from the database in the first place. With this setup, the filter changing does not trigger a new request to the database because the request declaration has no dependency on the filter declaration. In this case, we would need the filter declaration to live above the request declaration in our reactive graph. Now, if either the page number or the filter changes, we want to trigger a new request to the database, which will use both the current page number and the current filter values to retrieve the appropriate data, which will then be passed on to our data declaration. This is looking like a reasonably realistic example now, but what about some error handling? This is where things get a bit more grey and into the world of subjective trade-offs. The approach I generally use in Angular with RxJS and Signals strays from what could more cleanly be represented in this simple reactive graph. I make some intentional and targeted declarative sacrifices for trade-offs that I think are worthwhile a lot of the time. I won't get into that here, but I have entire videos dedicated to that, which I'll link to in the description. But I wanted to give you that context so you know that the approach I'm about to show you, an approach that can be cleanly represented in our reactive graph here, is not the way I typically approach things. It is, however, an approach I have used with success, there is nothing wrong with it, and an argument could be made for it being the better and cleaner approach anyway. So we need to consider that our HTTP request may actually fail, and we are going to need to handle that. There will likely be a scenario where we need to show some error in the UI, and so we need access to that error data just like we do for our page data. For that, we can add an additional error declaration alongside our data declaration. Both of these are derived from our request declaration. The data declaration will only take the successful emissions from the request, and our error stream will take the errors. Now we can utilize both the data and the errors in our UI, the data and errors can change over time, and all of this has been created declaratively. The data in our application changes, but we never have to reassign anything, which gives us all the benefits of declarative code that I talked about in the previous video. Being able to construct a mental model of these reactive graphs, which determine how values change without being reassigned, is, I think, the key to understanding the declarative approach. Whilst RxJS is a popular and great tool for implementing a reactive graph, when attempting to learn this stuff, it might be better to frame it as how do I construct a reactive graph for this scenario rather than how do I build this with RxJS. Once you have the graph, or at least some mental model of it, then you can look into how to implement that with RxJS, or whatever else you like that has the equivalent necessary features. If you found this video helpful, please consider a like or subscribe before you go, and I hope to see you back here again.